Hi. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Steve Jobs, and uh, I love to demo our computers. So uh, some folks asked me to demo it for a videotape uh, so that they could share it with some of their friends that I haven't had a chance to meet yet. And what we're going to do today is run through a pretty simple demo of what we call interpersonal computing. Interpersonal computing is the desire to improve group productivity and collaboration, which we think is going to be one of the key uses of sophisticated desktop computers in the early 90s versus just personal computing, which was improving individual productivity. So as we move to interpersonal computing, the way we communicate is what's going to be important here. And we want to communicate not with just words, but with words in any text, pictures, sounds. And uh, I'm going to take you through how a Next computer enables you to do this in a revolutionary new way. And I'm going to use our mail system as the spine of the demo to show you some pretty neat features. So let's start. First of all, a Next computer is a multitasking computer, which means I can be navigating around through my files and at the same time uh, instantly check my mail and have all these programs wanting it, running at once, as we'll see. And rather than quit a program, I can hide it. In this case, hiding the workspace behind the logo here or hiding my mail behind its icon over here, which is the little uh, letter with the postage stamp on it. So let me go ahead and hide the workspace and get out the mail. And I can look at my mail system literally hundreds of times a day because in a half a second, I'm reading my mail. So let's take a look at this first uh, mail message. Here's all of the mail messages I've gotten. And I can look at a list of them. I have 12 of them here. And the one that's highlighted shows its contents down below. Here's the picture of the person, in this case, Rich Page, who sent the mail message, the date and the time that it was sent, and some other buttons over here that let me do some pretty neat things, which we'll go into in just a sec. Now, this message sent by Rich uh, shows me the layout or a picture, I guess a diagram, of our new SCSI connector. And I can smoothly scroll through it. And notice that uh, in our mail system, we can put PostScript uh, of any font, any size. Uh, we can put any color diagrams in uh, created by uh, PostScript drawing programs or other types of drawing programs. And we just send it. Let's take a look at the next one. Uh, Bob Longo uh, has sent us a mail message about our new, uh, a new office space uh, that he wants to lease. It's only 20 minutes from the airport, he says. And what he did was scanned in a picture of it with a color scanner, dropped it right in the mail message, and sent it. This is probably going to really increase his chances for getting the uh, funds approved for him to rent the space. Now, if I want to send this mail message to some of my colleagues, I can simply go up here to send and push the button. Up pops a send window. And I can push forward, in which case uh, the contents of Bob's uh, message will be stuck in this uh, window for forwarding. There we go. There's the picture right there. And uh, of course, I could modify it if I wanted to, or I could add some things. Let's say where it says policy team here, I'm going to put in some, uh, a voicemail message. And I'll just push lip service right here, which brings up our lip service uh, uh, function. And I push record. I say, hey, uh, check this out and get back to me. Thanks. And I'll then insert it. And here are the lips right here. I can put them uh, pretty much wherever I want to. And the recipient will just simply click on this and play it. Hey, uh, check this out and get back to me. Thanks. And I can look up people's addresses simply by pushing the address panel. And we're not connected to the network here. But as you see, you can look up groups of people and just uh, click on here. Look up at the personnel department, maybe Max Henry. And uh, just deliver it by pushing this button right here. So as you see, uh, it's extremely easy for even executives to use this thing. OK, we'll get rid of this uh, window. Go back over here. Here's Teo, uh, a message from Teo Wegbren. He's our president of Next Europe. And he's going to hire a bunch of people. And he's sending out this welcome message to all his new team members. So of course, he has some that uh, speak English as their primary language. Congratulations on joining the best computer company in the world. We have ambitious plans for Next Europe. And I look forward to working together with you to make them a reality. You can see that the CD sound that's built into every computer and, of course, the microphone really is nice. Now, Teo's going to hire some people with French as their primary language, so we have a version in French. Félicitations de votre entrée dans la meilleure compagnie d'ordinateurs du monde. Nous avons des projets ambitieux pour Next Europe et nous nous réjouissons d'avance de notre coopération afin qu'on puisse les réaliser. And German? Herzlichen Glückwunsch zum Beit. You get the idea. So 
here Teo uh, is sending a message to each of his new employees and communicating them with, uh, with them in their native tongue. Now, this is uh, another thing we can do with the system quite easily. We've seen how we can put text in any size or style or font. We can put in illustrations. We can put in photographs. We can even put in CD quality sound. Now, I want to send a spreadsheet to my colleagues, let's say, or in this case, Sandy Coles wanted to send one to me. And rather than having to look through a 300-page manual to figure out how to do this, Sandy just had to drag the document icon of this Lotus spreadsheet right into the mail window, and it stuck. And then she just uh, wrote the text and pushed deliver. And you can put as many attachments like this as you want, any file, any document in your mail message, as well as any number of lips for voice annotations. And send it. the recipient simply double clicks on the icon, which launches, in this case, Lotus Improv over here. Up pops what Sandy wanted to send me. This happens to be the new Lotus spreadsheet. And uh, this is a spreadsheet that has to do with uh, looking at expenses. Here are some costs for programmers, consultants, and student aides in various departments uh, in a campus, the humanities, science, and engineering, and the medical school. These costs, some other costs are you know, the annual, the staff, the hourly pay for the years of 1989 and 90. And I won't go into improv too much here, although you should really examine it. It is a breakthrough revolutionary product. The one thing I will show you is that if uh, I happen to be the uh, dean of the humanities college, I might want to see all the humanities information here, which is listed in four places, uh, really all in the same place. And rather than asking Sandy to redo her whole spreadsheet, in improv, I can simply pick up this tab down here, which is the colleges, and move it over to the rightmost or leftmost side. And the spreadsheet will instantly reorient itself so I can see all the humanities information now in one place. I might want to see that uh, really by cost, so I can bring this one down here. And again, the spreadsheet will instantly reorient itself. And I might want to move the staff up here. Uh, or I might want to actually move it on top and see the years right like this. And again, I can play with the spreadsheet any way I want to. Uh, I can put the years over here in the third dimension and look at the spreadsheet for 1989 and 1990, however I really want to. And improv lets you instantly manipulate the structure of your spreadsheet as fluidly as you can the data. So I'm, I'm through with improv for now. And uh, I get back to my message from Sandy with the spreadsheet and marvel at how easy it was for her to send it to me. This down here, uh, this mail message is from uh, Vicki Amon. And, uh, I guess this is sort of a newsletter here uh, describing a fundraising poster. And this is a WordPerfect document. Again, the person just dragged the WordPerfect document into the mail. I double click on it, and it runs. And as you know, this is our uh, the WordPerfect's latest version of WordPerfect uh, that runs only on the next computer. And it is totally compatible with everything they have out there. Uh, their 70% market share. But it is the first true WYSIWYG version of WordPerfect, which means that what you see is what you get. You can see headers, footnotes, everything on the screen. You can even do things like take pictures and uh, drag them over here, and the text will instantly reorient around the picture. I can go from no columns to two columns with the selection of a, uh, of a menu here, or three columns. And if you'll notice, the picture is automatically uh, resized by PostScript people that are used to using WordPerfect marvel at uh, what you can do with this full WYSIWYG WordPerfect. OK, so Vicki has uh, sent me this, and I've had a chance to peruse it. Let me show you something a little more complicated now. This is a mail message that contains four separate elements outside of just the body of text. Rich Page has sent me this, and he sent me a layout, possibly of a newsletter, uh, some text from a word processor. And that's these two up here. And this right here is the document icon from an application called TouchType, which is a really marvelous application that typesetters love because it allows you to perfectly kern headlines. This down here is a TIFF color photograph. These four documents and photographs came in the same mail message, but they could have come in four separate mail messages from four different people on four different continents. Now, the first one, which I've brought up by simply double-clicking on it, is that frame document. And the frame document here uh, might have come from my graphic arts department. And this is the layout for my magazine. 
So I'll select the um, headline here and go over here and simply drag this document from touch type right in, and it will image it right in the border of my newsletter. And I'll go over here and select the body copy, and I'll go grab my text and drop it in here. And it will be dropped into frame. And frame is asking me whether I want to treat line endings as paragraphs. And I say, sure. So it drops the text in. And then I'll go select the photograph here. And I'll go simply click on this photograph, and an EPS icon will pop up. This is an encapsulated PostScript format picture. And I simply drag it out of the window, just like uh, the, uh, the uh, originator, Rich, dragged it in. And I drop it here in frame, and it images right in frame. And I can go over here and say, I don't want to view my borders, and it'll take away the borders. And I'm not aware of any other system in the world that will do this. The seamless integration between four applications that we've seen here, none of them knowing anything about the other one. An application that does special kerning on headline text, a word processor that created the body copy, a photograph scanned by some application, just simply dragged in to our fourth application, which is frame containing all of the other three. Again, none of these applications know anything about the others. And I'm not, again, aware of any other system that would let you do this. So we'll quit FrameMaker here. Now we'll go to another uh, really interesting one, Gary Moore. Gary has sent me uh, a voicemail message, so let's hear what he has to say. Steve, I'm in a rush now, but I wanted to let you know that we now have some Supreme Court decisions online, thanks to Project Hermes. If you look in my home directory, I'm on the legal server, you will find the cases. Just message the digital librarian and you can examine them. Well, this was, a, this was quite a bit here. Uh, Gary told us to go onto the legal server, which is on the network, and go into his home directory, the place where he has all his files, and take a look at a file he's got, which is a folder containing all of the Supreme Court decisions, I think, between 1987 and 1990 and then to message the digital librarian and take a look at some of the cases. So let's go find out what this all means. We go to our file viewer here, which is the way we navigate around our system. And we go to our basic system, which is a next dimension color system. And here's our home directory down here. This is what's inside our home directory. Here's all my files here that I'm using to do this demo with. And uh, I'll go back to the system because Here's something else I want. Whenever I want to go out over the network, I simply click on the net icon, which is a globe, and it shows me everything on the network. There might be many servers, but for this demonstration, there's just one. And I click on the server, and it shows me what's inside the server. Well, there's three departments. And I click on legal, and sure enough, here's three people's home directories. Other people's home directories show up as these two little houses, so I don't get it confused with my own. And I want to go inside Gary's system. If Gary's given me permission, I can see what's on his system. And sure enough, here's those Supreme Court cases. Now, if you notice what's happened, each time I've clicked something, it's appeared up here. Because now I have a complete record of where I've come from, all the way from my next dimension system, all the way down through the network to the Supreme Court cases. So I never get lost as I traverse a complicated network. I'll show you something else that's pretty amazing. If I'm going to interact with Gary a lot, and we've decided to put some special documents on his system that we're going to share, I simply bring Gary's icon up here, put it anywhere I want, and I can get at it instantly. It's like programming a radio button on your car. The radio station may take a second to find, but once you've found it, you program a button and can get to it instantly. So now, my home directory is automatically put up here. If I want to get back to my home, I just push this button, and I'm instantly taken back to my home directory. If I want to get back to Gary, I simply push this button, and I'm instantly taken back through that whole path of the network to Gary's system, and here's the file in question. I can even put this file up here if I want. And now I can go between my home directory or anything else that I happen to have programmed, and the Supreme Court case is right here. This is an ability of the next computer to allow mere mortals to traverse very sophisticated networks and to share information with each other in a way that is far easier than any other networking software that has been created. And yet, we're still using the industry standard NFS file system. So we're compatible with every workstation in the marketplace. Okay, 
Now, Gary then said, after we found these Supreme Court cases, to message the digital librarian. What did he mean? What he meant was that we should go over here to this application called Services, which is a new menu item that appears in every application on our release 2.0 software. And Services is not owned by the application. It's owned by the operating system. And applications can register themselves as a service and will then show up in every single application, the one shipped on the machine and every third-party application as well. What does this mean? Well, one of the applications that we ship for free with every next computer is our own digital librarian application. And digital librarian appears as a service. And I go up here and I say, please make whatever I have selected, i.e. the Supreme Court cases, the target. And so these Supreme Court cases are going to be put into the digital librarian automatically. And the digital librarian has built an index for these cases, which will allow me to find anything by keyword. The first thing I'll do is look at how many titles I have. There's 78 different cases here that the Supreme Court has written up in the last three years. Well, finding something in that is going to be like a needle in a haystack. And that's where the digital librarian comes in. I can say, find me every case that has the word patent in it. And I type in patent, and I hit return, and instantly there's four cases up here. Well, let's take a look at this one. This is a case, I've looked at it before, a uh, Supreme Court case of Eli Lilly uh, versus Medtronic. And I can see the digital librarian has found the word patent down here. And this is the minority opinion of the court, uh, Justice Kennedy uh, dissenting. And I can go back over to the digital librarian and look at this one here, which is the majority opinion of the court. Here again, it's found the word patent. And I can scroll up to the beginning of the case. This is the same case with Justice Scalia delivering the majority opinion of the court. And again, what I've done here is I've got a message from Gary Moore who's told me to go use the file viewer, traverse a complicated network that I, as a mere mortal, can do now that we have the right tools, find something on his system that we're sharing, message it to the digital librarian, use the digital librarian to find the needle in the haystack, which in this case is the word patent, pull up these two cases and find what I'm looking for. I, again, don't know of any other computer system where this is possible. Let me give you another example of messaging between applications, or as some people call it, inter-application communication. I can take the word infringement here, or any other word I care to select, and go over to the services menu again and pick up define in Webster's. So I'll pick define in Webster's, and that will bring up the digital Webster dictionary that we ship, throw the word infringement into it, and show me the definition as well as the thesaurus. And of course, this happened a lot faster than I could say it. It happened almost instantly. Here's our definition for the word infringement. Let me hide Webster's again. I'll pick another one, opinion, define in Webster's. Very rapidly, there it is. Having these tools at our disposal is something the computer user has never had before. Another thing I might point out is I'm using many applications here. I'm using digital Webster's. I've got these file viewers up that came from the digital librarian. These came from the file viewer right here. And of course, mail is what started it all when Gary told me to go find some stuff on his system and take a look at it. OK. Let's quit the digital librarian here. Let's put Webster's away for now. And let's go ahead and hide my file viewer as well. And get rid of these little windows as well. OK. Um, our next message here is. Uh, a simple one, again, uh, somebody wants to buy some shares. And uh, there's two little icons down here. One is for an application that we've written ourselves here at Next. Next Step allows us to write applications so fast that in a day or two, we can write some very, very simple apps that yet really help us as we run our business. Here's one that allow has allowed us to completely eliminate paper flow in requesting uh, purchase requisitions. We have identical apps for check requisitions, vacation time off approvals, et cetera. And this app simply lets me you know, pick a ship to address, one of many that uh, Next supports, and uh, allows the um, originator to fill in all the information, and then allows me to, uh, to approve it by using my Unix password here. Do you really need this? Well, all right. It's part of our expense control. And I simply mail it back then to the originator. Uh, the second document is a right now document that I think simply is a confirmation letter of the exact uh, chair that we want to buy that is going to go to the uh, supplier. 
So here we have it. Again, this was created very, very simply by just scanning a color photograph and dragging it into this document. Okay, the next one here is, um, again, a simple right now document, word processing document, that summarizes uh, some of First Boston's uh, test results on the 68040, the microprocessor that we use in all of our new computers. And of course, the results are it's very fast. Now, this is a very nice testimonial, and we might like to fax this to some of our software developers so that they could see for themselves how fast the 040 is. Under normal circumstances, I would print this out on our 400 dot per inch laser printer. It would come out very nicely. And I would go get a nice fax machine, so say a nice $3,000 Canon fax machine, and I would fax it. And what would come out the other end would not quite look as good as what I put in, but indeed uh, it would get there. We have eliminated the need to print anything out on a laser printer. We have eliminated the need to go searching through the office to find the fax machine wherever somebody may have moved it. We have eliminated the need to go buy a $3,000 fax machine, and we have dramatically improved the output that arrives at the other end. Let me show you what I mean. Normally on an X machine, when you want to print something out, you go to the print menu. You push it, and up pops a print panel. looks something like this. And you can select uh, what type of printer you want to use, et cetera, and you just normally push this button called print. Well, we've added a new button to our release 2.0 software that appears in every single application and it's called the fax button. You push the fax button and you get a new panel, which is the fax panel. And in the fax panel, all of the people that you've stored phone, fax phone numbers for appear, and you can pick one, Motorola, Lotus, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, these are fake fax numbers. And uh, so let's say I'm going to send this to Adobe. And of course, I can add numbers, delete numbers, et cetera. I th can ask for a notification in the mail system whenever the fax is delivered, cover letters, et cetera. And I simply push this fax button over here. And when I push this fax button, a remarkable thing happens. Normally, everything you see on the screen of a next computer goes through PostScript, which means that the file is sent through PostScript, and PostScript is turned to 92 dots per inch, and it, we image the file on the screen. That same file is sent through PostScript. When the knob is turned to 400 dots per inch, to go to our laser printer. We take that exact same file and we feed it through PostScript with the knob turned at 200 dots per inch, which is the Group 3 International Fax Standard. We then compress it with our special software and send it out through one $500 fax modem, which can be shared over the network with up to 100 people. And it is then sent on its way to the fax printer down the road. When it gets there, the printer will print out something that looks substantially better than any fax you've ever seen before. Because our PostScript software does a much better job of rendering the fax with high fidelity than the scanner on modern fax machines does. And you have to see this for yourself to believe it. So we have built in now a way to fax that is substantially better than faxing by hand on the best fax machine and saves you from running all over the office because it's totally electronic and takes advantage of next network. OK, now what happens when we get an incoming fax? When we get an incoming fax, all the incoming faxes are sent to one central folder and can be distributed uh, by a person throughout the mail system, or you can just look there to find your incoming faxes. And we have a fax reader program that comes with the system that shows you exactly what a fax looks like. And this is captured right off the fax modem. This is a fax from John Warnick at Adobe, the CEO of Adobe. And um, I can actually read it here, save paper, save a tree. Uh, but unfortunately, I can't edit it. And if I cut it and paste it and want to put it in other applications, I have to just treat it as a picture because, of course, it's just a fax. But in the next system, I can do so much more. I can select this right in the fax reader program. And I can go back to our menu of services. And one of the services that has been created by one of our third parties, HSD, is called OCR Servant, Optical Character Recognition. And I can say I want to OCR the selection that I just made. And down here, the OCR Servant from HSD runs. It automatically picks up all the data from the last application and puts it in my window here, fully OCR'd. And I can then go and say I want to change the font on this by bringing up our font panel. 
I'll stick with Helvetica maybe, make it 24 points. As you can see, our font panel allows us to um, change the fonts on anything very, very easily. And here we go. Nice big Helvetica. And as you can see, of course, I can edit it to my heart's delight. I can even pick a word like software, go to the services menu, look it up in Webster's. Here we go. So we've gone from a mail message with an incoming fax to looking at that fax with a fax reader program to OCRing that fax with a third party OCR program to looking up a word in the OCR fax in our Webster's dictionary. Again, uh, I'm not aware of any other system that will allow you the seamless integration between applications and ability to just move data through these various applications to get what you want. This last mail message uh, you might find a little humorous, but I think it's very important. Uh, this last mail message is just alerting everybody to a pizza fest. Um, why did I put this on here? Because one of the largest concerns that we hear when we talk to small and medium-sized companies or departments within even large companies is how do we keep the culture of our company going as we grow? How do we keep the communication that's one of our key competitive advantages while we're small as we grow? And what we've seen here at Next in our own company and what we've seen at many, many of our customers is that this technology increases the level of communication to a degree that is stunning and brings organizations together and makes the organization work as if it was a much smaller, tighter-knit team. And that's not just a business phenomenon. It's not just a technical phenomenon. It's a sociological phenomenon. And the, not only the quantity, but the quality of communication has increased dramatically because of this technology. And you have to use it to really understand what I mean. Just as if I was trying to explain a spreadsheet or desktop publishing to you many years ago. You have to sit down and actually use it. And I encourage all of our customers to do exactly that. Okay, two last things I wanted to show you, which are now moving outside the realm of interpersonal computing, but show off some of the fun features of our machine. The first is our color abilities. Uh, these are two color images, full 32-bit, and you'll notice that I'm actually moving them around real time. For those of you that have ever tried to do this on a PC or a Macintosh, uh, you know how remarkable this is. Uh, as an example, on a Macintosh, you would not be moving the images around real time, but rather just outlines of the windows. And of course, you would be waiting forever for the underlying windows that were exposed as we move the top one to redraw. So you can both look at the quality of these images, but also how fluidly we can work with them. And uh, this results in not only people doing better work, but doing it in far less time because they're not waiting for the computer. And the last thing I wanted to show you was an application we wrote uh, for our introduction, which is a very simple application that just illustrates some of the things that we've built into our system at the most fundamental level of the software. So that as people write application software, people like Adobe, like Quark, et cetera, they don't have to spend six to 12 months creating these capabilities as they do on every other computer. They can get on with making the application a breakthrough. So the first thing I'm going to show you is I'm going to put a Ferrari on the beach here. And uh, it puts it on the beach like most computers can with a big black box around it, except that the next computer saves what we call transparency information and allows us to actually see through the places in this black box that are not really part of the car or are transparent or partially opaque. So now we can move the car around. You can even see a little bit through the windshield of the car there. We can see the top of the mountain, as you, as you can see. And uh, let's go get Donald Duck here. We can go take the black box off of Donald. And you'll see that Donald has a shadow under his feet. We can see that on the water. We can even see it up in the clouds here. And it's very realistic. We can move Donald down here. And matter of fact, we can even put Donald behind the Ferrari. And now you'll see uh, Donald poking through above and through the windshield or side windows of the Ferrari. This gives you an example of the capabilities just built right into the next system software.
Let me show you a few more. Uh, let me get rid of the background here. And uh, I'll show you how we select colors. In the next computer, as you know, we have a standard font panel, which allows the user to select fonts in one uniform way and saves the developer a lot of time because we create it for them. In the same way, we wanted to provide the users one single way to select colors and, again, provide the work for the developer so that they don't have to spend their time reinventing the wheel. So one simply moves around this color circle and selects a color. If you like the color, you can move it down here and save it. Uh, or, of course, you can move other colors back in to retrieve them. You can get as much space here as you'd like for various colors. So we can say we like this color. And we can look at this color not just in our color wheel here, but as red, green, blue, RGB. And we can turn the knobs on this color if we want to make it a little bit different. We can look at the same color as printers do with cyan, magenta, yellow, black, or CYMK. Uh, and diddle the color there. Or we can look at it as hue, saturation, brightness, and we can change our color here. Or we can even get out a magnifying glass and say that we really want to get the, the blue on Donald's cap right here. We'll save that. And p this is how we can pick colors in a variety of ways. Well, what I'm going to do is go back here to the background. And why don't we pick this blue and make the background maybe that color blue. And pick Donald right here. And let's do some airbrushing. Let's go ahead and pick an airbrush and say that we're going to airbrush just behind Donald. And let's go pick a nice bright, maybe yellow, to airbrush. And we'll just go airbrush right behind Donald. If you notice, it's only going behind him. You can make a little halo around him here. So now that when we move Donald around, he's got his little halo. And we have not uh, drawn on top of him. Let me give you another uh, even more dramatic example of that. Let's pick our Ferrari here. And uh, let's draw behind the Ferrari. Let's uh, say that we want to draw some bricks around the Ferrari, matter of fact, in back of the Ferrari. And now we can simply draw bricks. And if you'll notice, they only go behind the Ferrari. They don't go on the Ferrari. So these are two pretty dramatic examples of how the software built into every next computer can dramatically save developers time. Let me show you one last thing, which is uh, not really been seen on any computer to date. And that is uh, a picture here out of Star Wars that happens to move. Real-time video. Let's go ahead and capture a frame here. Here's a frame we've captured here. We can even uh, take Donald if we want to. Up here. In our moment of triumph, I seem to overestimate their chances. So as you see, we have real-time video in a window that's fully digital. We don't even have to have it be the top window unlike uh, most other systems on the market that offer video. And uh, video is in a window just like any other window. We can grab frames, uh, move these things around real time, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we think that there's really no other system on the market that lets you do all of these things. I've been uh, doing this demonstration on our Next Dimension color product, our state-of-the-art, leading-edge color product that costs uh, a little over $15,000. However, Everything you've seen here today, with two exceptions, runs identically well on our $7,995 Next Station color product. Same speed, everything. And the two exceptions are only that on Next Station color, the windows are 16-bit color instead of 32-bit color. And what that means is, is that to the most discerning expert, they can tell a little bit of difference. But for 99% of us, we'll never see the difference. And you don't get the video on Next Station Color. But other than that, they're identical. The windows move around at the same speed. Performance is the same. So our software runs across all of our platforms, from 49.95 Next Stations all the way up through Next Dimensions. And our two color systems, again, are virtually identical. Hope this gives you some insight into what we can do. and. Uh, as each month passes, we get more and more third-party applications 
that really take color where color has never been before on a desktop platform. Thanks for a chance to uh, let me show you our system. Hope you like it.